Okay, everybody, well, welcome back. It's uh, end of the break time. Uh, we've had just a terrific session so far, and uh, we're going to continue uh, with that. We are so pleased to have uh, our next guest, uh, who many of you know well, uh, Jeffrey Gunlack, CEO of Double Line Capital. Uh, Jeffrey uh, founded Double Line in 2009 and now manages about $140 billion uh, of assets across many different strategies. He was named uh, the new bond king by Barron's in 2011, and has been the recipient of numerous investment awards that you can see uh, listed in his bio in your uh, materials. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeffrey is a graduate of Dartmouth College with degrees in both uh, math and philosophy, uh, two disciplines that I think serve investors <laughs> very well, especially these days. Um, before I turn it over to Jeffrey, we're just going to do a quick fun thing to learn something interesting about Jeffrey away from uh, investments. So Gigi, can you put up our, our little uh, poll question? There we go. Uh, so besides all of Jeffrey's fabulous accomplishments uh, in his professional life, he has some lesser known successes. So you can see if you can pick the uh, uh, following statement that is, uh, is correct. He was a competitive rower. He designed and built his own hang glider. He writes and plays his own songs, broke the record for chin-ups at his elementary school, or flips houses with his brother. So you could take a few minutes to do that. And uh, Jeffrey, before we go to Q&A after your presentation, we're gonna reveal uh, this, uh, this fun fact about you. So right. um, again, Jeffrey, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. We uh, were very looking, for, looking forward to your uh, discussion and we're gonna save some time uh, for some Q&A. So if all of our members get their questions ready, you can ask either live or through the, uh, the chat function. So Jeffrey, I will turn it over to you. All right, so am I controlling the slides or no, there's someone on your end, that's fine. So this, obviously the uh, title here is, Hey Kid Wants Some Candy which refers to, of course, you, you teach your children not to take candy from strangers because it could lead to some unpleasant outcomes. But what we're kind of doing uh, societally is spewing all kinds of candy around and it's had tremendous effects on society, on the economy and on the markets. And we're gonna go through some of that uh, in this presentation. Um, here's an interesting slide. This is global GD GDP forecasts by year. And you just, it just takes the median estimate from economists, mainstream economists. And it, uh, they start guessing a few years before uh, the year comes into focus. So the guess for 2020 started way back. It looks like at the beginning of 2018. And a couple of interesting things come out of this chart. The first is how stable global GDP, real GDP was from 2014 into 2018. And you'll notice that in a not terribly observable way, but it started to weaken uh, going into 2019. And then of course, with the COVID situation, we see this en enormous deficit in uh, world GDP now estimated to be negative 3.9 real for 2020 to be uh, followed by now the guess is 5.2. Now keep those numbers in mind, negative 3.9 for 2020 and plus 5.2 is the guess for 2021. If we go to the next slide, it's the same guessing game for the United States. And what's sort of interesting here is the pattern is very similar in terms of stability. This goes all the way back to 2010. So we had quite a lot of economic stability. And then we started to weaken again into uh, 2019 and then of course 2020. But notice that the guess for 2020 now is negative 4.0. So the world is negative 3.9, US is negative 4.0. So the guess for the world X US is actually slightly less negative than is for the US. So forecasters are guessing the United States will be weaker than the rest of the world in 2020. And again, in 2021, because the 2021 forecast for the world is 5.2 and for the United States, it's only 3.7. So it's interesting that the guesses of economic growth show that the US would be weaker than the rest of the world, excluding the United States. So we're gonna keep that in mind as we look at relative market performance in a few minutes. If we go to the next slide, well, let's skip this one. We'll go to the next slide. This is the Fed's balance sheet. And of course, we're all aware that the Fed started quantitative easing in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And they got up to about 3.5, uh, actually they got up to about $4 trillion. And then they tried to eliminate the quantitative easing. And of course that led to 
massive volatility in financial markets. We've had two bear markets in under two years uh, in global uh, stock markets, United States included, had a bear market in the fourth quarter of 2018 and a bear market again, one of the most severe, uh, uh, insanely rapid bear markets here in the, the second quarter of, of, of uh, 2020. And now they've stopped uh, quantitative easing. They certainly have made it clear that they're willing to do really uh, unlimited quantitative easing per the chair, uh, Jay Powell, but we're up at about $7 trillion now on the balance sheet. And it's had tremendous effects. If you go to the next slide, uh, what we, one thing we've been talking about for years is the trend in the deficit in the United States is very bad. And we were already heading into a very severe deficit pre-COVID where you'll see that that red shaded area in the bottom panel was the same percentage of GDP at about 5% even though the economy was perceived to be relatively robust with about a two and a half percent real GDP pre-COVID, it was based upon tremendous deficit spending of the ilk that characterizes past depths of recessions, if you go back to the 80s and the 90s. So we've taken on an enormous deficit burden. And if we split the page, we'll take a look at it as a percentage of GDP, uh, public outstanding debt has now reached the highest level in the United States history even exceeding the uh, World War II debt of the 1940s. So there's an awful lot of debt out there. Now, one thing that's very different about this response to a recession on the next slide is you'll see that for the first time probably in economic history, we actually have an increase in disposable income, personal disposable income, the blue line, uh, thanks to the Fed's response and the Treasury Department's response to the COVID recession crisis, we actually have a huge spike in disposable income. But if you take away the transfer payments, uh, you would have the red line, which would be more typical of a recession, where you have had, would have had a huge decrease in disposable income. So there's been essentially a $3 trillion stimulus put into the economy, and it's had very uneven effects across the economic spectrum, which we'll see in just a moment. If you flip to the next slide, you'll see a, a very unusual for a recession Thanks to the Fed's $3 trillion and the government's $3 trillion stimulus to personal income, probably for the first time in history, we've actually seen a decrease in consumer loan delinquencies and credit card delinquencies. The dotted line is credit cards. The uh, solid line is consumer loan delinquencies. They've actually gone down to one of the lowest levels of the past 30 years thanks to the Fed's action. So this is highly unusual. Now, <clears throat> much has been made on the next slide of how the stimulus payments and the unemployment uh, benefits, let's, let's slip the, skip this sentiment slide. The, here's the, uh, it, thanks to the um, payments of uh, uh, unemployment uh, bonuses and stimulus checks, just on the unemployment bonuses that were $600 per week, 76% of the unemployed were making more money not working than they were pre-COVID working. And there was an executive order that was signed August 8th that was going to take that uh, back to three, $300. That would still be slightly more than half of all workers making more unemployed than when they were employed pre-COVID. So it's a very odd situation. If we flip the next page, we'll see, let's skip that one. Get next page. Okay, uh, we see very different effects of the stimulus by various economic categories. This chart shows education level. So we have a, uh, the line at the top is those that have a bachelor degree or higher, and they are all the way back to the same employment pre-COVID. So the unemployment deficit was not that big and was completely filled. And as you go down the spectrum, all the way down to the, the line at the bottom, the darker line, less than a high school diploma are still nearly 20% less employment than pre-COVID. So sadly, the stimulus, while it's a very blunt instrument, has, has been somewhat effective. Unfortunately, it's very different across the economic strata, which leads to, uh, against the backdrop of already high vitriol amongst wealth inequality and amongst society, this clearly serves to make that worse. If we move to the next slide, this is the change in employment by wage ranges. So it's the same sort of a picture. Uh, those that make less than $16 an hour uh, they're still down over 25% in terms of their um, employment. And if you go up to those that make more than $28 an hour, they're actually fully recovered. So this is an extremely uneven economic recovery. If we go to the next slide, uh, what we see is that temporary layoffs 
uh, which are which means that people are laid off, but they're looking for a job. That spiked uh, in a historical kind of way uh, in March and April of this year. And then uh, what started to happen in more recent months is those that were looking for a job have been temporarily laid off are now moving into the permanent loss category, which means that they're not even looking for a job anymore. So this economic damage is going to continue to uh, re reverberate uh, through the economy as uh, those that are were discouraged by getting uh, benefits from the government and still looking for a job have turned into discouraged workers. On the next page, we have the K-shaped recovery, which is much in the news and it's quite correct. This shows that employment rates uh, are very different. If you're in a high wage situation, so this is very much like the uh, educational chart that we showed a few slides ago, those that are highly educated tend to be higher wages and they're all the way back to only a 1% uh, unemployment uh, increase thanks to COVID. If you go down to those that are low wage, less than 27,000 a year, again, we're at about a 20% job loss. And I suspect that, that these lines having flattened out are not likely to improve much in the future absent some sort of major uh, policy uh, stimulus. On the next page, we see small businesses are really suffering. So we saw that some unemployment categories and wage categories have fully recovered, but nowhere in the small business category has there been anything close to a full recovery? The black line is the total of small businesses and the closures are 24%. So small businesses opening up, there's 24% less uh, than there were in January of 2020. And it's particularly acute, not surprisingly in leisure and hospitality, but even in retail and transportation, we still see significant double digit uh, decline in small business openings. On the next page, we see consumer spending by income group, which uh, again corroborates the very strange uh, effect of the government stimulus checks. What you see is that low income uh, people actually have, are spending more than they were pre-COVID. Well, why not? That's because they're, getting, they're making more unemployed than they were getting when they were employed. And of course, at that low economic tier, uh, there's very little saving that goes on. They're basically spending on necessities. And there's actually been a remarkable 6.5% increase in low income spending. Meanwhile, at the high income level, I think the COVID lockdown put the fear of God into a lot of people, understanding that uh, they could lose their job and uh, we might be in a slow economic situation for quite some time. And so higher income people have actually curtailed their spending and have started to save. And I believe that that's a healthy trend and it's a trend that I don't think is going to change. I, I think people took a, got a look into the abyss and realized probably that uh, maybe they need to have something of a rainy day fund. Let's go to some of the effects of COVID and where we stand. Here's the work from home statistics. Back in February, a small sliver, maybe about 10% or slightly less of people were working at home every day. And then all of a sudden in May, it jumped up to about, I don't know, 35% or so. It's been relatively stable since then. So now about 25% of the workforce in the United States is doing work from home. And I'm quite sure that we will never go back and never is a, is a, is a strong word, but I'm using it intentionally that we'll never go back to only 10% of the population working from home. At Double Line, some of our employees particularly in functions like uh, IT, will probably continue working from home in perpetuity. Let's take a look at uh, the next slide, which is travel and TSA, so this is airline travel. It's gradually recovered, but it's down now at about a million TSA travelers. A year ago, it was more than two and a half million, so way less than half, and will probably, again, never go back. Hotel occupancy rates, similar situation. 2009 is the black line that was the depths of recession. We're still significantly below that and have flatlined or moving into a seasonally weak period. And then finally, the back to work barometer, um, which kind of corroborates that lack of uh, uh, return to work three slides ago. This is the Castle back to work barometer and it's down to, uh, it's gradually increased. We've got them for many metropolitan areas. The red line is the top 10 metropolitan area average and we're off about 75% from where we were before. Interestingly, here I'll have to talk next slide about vaccine. The vaccine is kind of the holy grail, but interestingly, the willingness of people to be vaccinated, and this is the question is, if it was approved by the FDA, available right now at no cost, would you agree to be vaccinated? 
half the population says no. So pretty clearly, you either need kind of uh, a totalitarian kind of regime where you force people to be injected with a vaccine, or else you're going to have 50%, and this is a declining trend, gently, maybe 50% won't even agree to be vaccinated. I'm highly skeptical that a vaccine is really going to be a, a silver bullet for this crisis. Uh, vaccines are not effective against coronaviruses through all of human history. The flu vaccine very often has a failure rate greater than 50%, and only 50% of the population, if it was a voluntary situation, is willing to uh, take that vaccine. Let's look at the strongest part of the economy, which is housing right now, because one of the effects of all of this lockdown is clearly we have seen demographic shifts in the way people choose to live their lives. We see on the bottom, let's just focus on that. This is the year over year medium, median sale price in the United States and it dipped in May and June, but it st was still positive year over year. But now look at how strong it is. Housing is just on fire in many parts of the country. And so not surprisingly with the government giving money away, um, some of it has found its way into housing. And in fact, if we get to the next page, one thing that is curious is that the volume of, of loans that are in forbearance and residential mortgages, it did go up in May, but it peaked very quickly and the government did succeed with its stimulus program in stopping a, uh, an avalanche of mortgage related defaults or a stoppage of payments. And in fact, these trends have started to improve pretty much across the board. These are Ginnie Mae, Fannie Mae, and then other, the yellow line is the total. So it peaked out at over eight and it's already down by about 200 basis points. So that's good news there. The next slide shows the supply of single family houses and how it has absolutely plummeted with this grab for uh, uh, home buying and getting away from more densely populated stack and pack type of living, which became so popular in the last 15 years in the major urban areas in the United States. So the supply of homes nationally is basically the lowest it's ever been. And the lowest was actually in 1999, 3.5 months of supply, but we're at 3.6 and the trend looks to me like we're gonna take out the all time low, but it's very uneven across the country. Take a look at the next slide. This is a real kind of shocker in a certain sense. This is active listings in San Francisco County, California. And we show the years 2015 through 2019. They were all pretty similar with a little bit of seasonality there. We're actually at a seasonal period where you expect a, a relatively low number of listings in San Francisco County. But look at this, where we've taken out the old paradigm by over 100% in terms of new listings. We're up at 2,000 homes for sale with a massive exodus from San Francisco. And the statistics are similar in other densely populated areas where there is, um, you know, defund the police and urban unrest and other things happening. Not surprisingly, people respond to that type of lifestyle shift. If we go to the next slide, you'll see what's more typical of more, what are perceived to be more desirable areas in the context of the COVID lockdown situation. Salt Lake City listings are less than half of where they were in the last three years. And this is true of many of the secondary cities, particularly those that are in more rural and lower tax areas. Obviously Nevada has no, um, no uh, tech. Salt Lake City, Utah is one of those areas and Nevada would be another one where there's actually no income tax. Next slide shows an unusual uh, situation relative to the last 20 years where the Atlanta Fed wage growth tracker is actually, um, that's the uh, red line, is actually higher on a year-over-year -year basis than the current 30-year mortgage rate. So historically, wage growth is less than where mortgage rates are. Currently, wage growth broadly is actually higher than the mortgage rate, which is really pretty good for housing. That's one of the reasons why that category is doing so well. I mean, after all, this is kind of a debt monetization kind of a situation. If, you're, if your mortgage rate is two and a half percent and your wage growth per year is three and a half, of course that can change and the mortgage rate won't change for 30 years uh, if you take it out today. But the wage growth, if it stays at three and a half, that's really debt monetization. Uh, in essence, you're, 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 you're getting more wage growth than you're actually paying an interest to your mortgage and your mortgage becomes more and more affordable, therefore, and your debt burden, therefore, becomes much more manageable. Let's look at the equity markets and look at some really remarkable things. This is the U.S. market, uh, the, M the Morgan Stanley U.S. index 
relative to the rest of the world going back 50 years. And just look at the last 10 years where the United States market has outperformed the Morgan Stanley World Index, which actually, excluding the US, that's the ratio we're doing here, the US relative to the world X US has exploded to the upside. The United States market has grossly outperformed the non-US world stock market. And the scale here is massive. It's outperformed by a factor of three. So the ratio has gone from 0.6 to 1.8. So the United States stock market has massively outperformed, which is very interesting, particularly this year, because at the beginning of this presentation, I pointed out that the prospects for economic growth in the United States are actually forecast to be worse than the, for, that, than the prospects for the entire rest of the world, excluding the United States, and the United, United States stock market continues to outperform. Let's uh, zoom, zoom out to a long-term chart of equity market tops. And I've used this chart before, but I think this is one of the most fascinating charts I've seen in the last couple of years. Now, what we do, we're mapping out the stock market performance of four regions of the world, Japan, Europe, emerging markets, the United States. And the late 90s, in, during, prior to the last three recessions and prior to the current recession, one region of the world greatly outperformed the other regions of the world. In the late 80s into 1990, it was Japan. Japan was viewed to be taking over the world. Their stock market was booming. Just look at that uh, purplish line, how much stronger it was than the other three lines. Then the recession came in the early 90s, and you'll notice that the Japanese market has never made it back to the 1990 peak. 30 years later, it hasn't made it back. Then in the late 90s, we see that Europe, uh, the green line was, this, was a very strong market, and it peaked uh, uh, in uh, 00. And then it declined in the, in the recession of the early 00s, and it's never made it back, not even close. And then you see going into the global financial crisis, emerging markets, the blue line, were by far the strongest market in the world with the ascension of China and a very weak dollar. And then the recession came, the global financial crisis, and emerging markets have never made it back to where they were prior to that recession. Now it's the United States which is clearly, clearly the strongest market in the world. And here we are in a recession. And my suspicion is this pattern will repeat based upon the relative valuations, the 3X outperformance of the last 10 years, and the pattern that the economic excesses that build up tend to uh, be reflected in one region of the world that then needs the most severe correction. If you go to the next slide, this is uh, remarkable. I just put this in because it's just so unusual. This is the percentage of the global stock market that is either energy and finance, and that's the dark line, versus tech and healthcare. What percentage of the market cap of the global financial uh, stock market is these uh, combination of two sectors? And we've got to an incredible extreme of tech and healthcare back prior to the dot-com bust. And then we got to a tremendous extreme in uh, energy and financials prior to the global financial crisis, and we're back to that incredible uh, alligator jaws extreme that looks remarkably similar to the situation prior to the dot-com bust. So it's interesting. The next page is the valuation of the United States stock market using the PE ratio. And we're at the same level basically as we were in the dot-com, uh, uh, basically a uh, prior to the dot-com stock market crash. The next page is the S&P uh, CAPE ratio, Dr. Schiller's Nobel Prize winning CAPE ratio research, which is now at 30.6, which is not as high as the global financial crisis because there's actually more earnings now in, our, in the current momentum market than there were in the dot-com momentum market. But we are at the same level as 1929, which uh, I, I would just suggest, does not suggest that the market is cheap. The next slide shows the market cap of the S&P 500 versus GDP, which th this only goes back to 1950, so a mere 70 years. And of course, we are at the highest level of the last 70 years, which uh, clearly does not indicate cheapness. The next page is another extraordinary relationship, growth versus value. Um, this is now more extreme than it was prior to the dot-com situation. I'll never forget that Julian Robertson, the legendary value investor, sadly couldn't take it anymore and closed up his value operation right there at the beginning of, of the year 2000 just in time for value to go on one of its greatest outperformance tears, but that's been taken out. So what we have right now is an incredibly concentrated growth momentum market 
which of course is dominated by the, what I call the super six, which is the next slide. This is the fangs plus Microsoft. This is what I call the S&P six versus the entire S&P. But would be more outstanding is if you look at the S&P 494, which is to take the S&P 500 and take out the super six. The S&P 494 hasn't made any progress in two years. Yet the S&P broadly has done very well, and it's because of this incredible outperformance, a doubling outperformance in just five years of the FANGs versus the S&P broadly. But you'll notice something has started to change here. You'll notice that in the past five months or so, the Super 6 are no longer outperforming because the white line is now going sideways or gently lower. That means that the generals that have been leading this entire market uh, increase since March 23rd are leaving the battlefield. The S&P 494, th those are the privates in the army, they left the battlefield a long time ago. Now the generals are leaving the battlefield. Next page is what's driving this market is momentum and retail investor activity. This is the number of online broker retail trades, which has gone from less than 100 at the beginning of this year to more than triple that. So we have a massive sentiment momentum retail frenzied market. However, there's some things to watch for to look for a break. The next page shows the Russell 2000. These are small caps. You'll notice those have not returned to new highs. In fact, they're lower than they were in 2018. Uh, but they're highly correlated to the high yield CDX, which is kind of a measure of the value of high yield protection, extremely tightly correlated. And for now, they're showing very much in sync. So the market is, at least from this perspective, not in a dislocated thing versus the credit market. The next page shows the same relationship. This is now the S&P 500 versus the dollar, uh, the dollar index. And these are also very highly correlated. So the thing to look for is dollar strength would very likely be a harbinger of weakness for the US stock market because dollar strength has been associated with weak stock market, dollar weakness, a strong stock market. However, the next page, the dollar is now hitting, it's right on a downward trend. So this is a very interesting time. If the dollar is to strengthen, we'd have to break this trend line and we'd probably move very quickly up to about 96. That would be, if the dollar even goes to 94 on the Dixie index, the DXY, one would should anticipate that we might see a crack lower in the stock market. And it's getting to the point where it's gonna to have to make a move one way or the other. Uh, let's skip the next slide and go on to one after that. This is on a couple moments on emerging markets. Emerging market uh, versus the all world index. Uh, that's the uh, black line. This is the relate. So when the black line's going up, emerging markets are outperforming the total global market. It's highly correlated to industrial metal prices. And you'll notice that industrial metal prices have been much stronger than the relative performance of emerging markets during this COVID lockdown period. That's probably because the healthcare systems and the general governance of emerging markets tend to be inferior, I think, to to more developed uh, uh, populations. But there's a huge divergence here that suggests that emerging markets could be on the cusp of outperformance uh, once the dollar uh, 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 get, gets into uh, a, a downtrend, which I do believe will happen in spades over a multi-year period. I'm expecting a very significant outperformance for emerging markets. Also, there's a high correlation, a leading correlation of China credit impulse versus industrial metals. And this chart suggests that that trend that we saw on the preceding slide of industrial metal strength is likely to continue, further bolstering the case for emerging markets. However, next slide, you'll see a tremendous divergence among actual performance this year uh, of, of, of emerging market uh, sectors. You'll notice that the Asian market, that's the red line, orange line on top, is actually very strong this year. Emerging markets in Asia are up 14% year to date. That's pretty good, whereas emerging markets in Latin America are down 33%. So emerging markets are not one catch-all category. They're very different depending upon the region. The next slide uh, just shows emerging market bond spreads. I just wanna point out that they're about average. So this is not equities, this is debt. Emerging market debt uh, blew out like all credit in the aftermath of lockdown. It's back uh, to kind of where it was on the wides of 2018. So on a spread basis, emerging market bonds look relatively attractive versus other risk sectors. Next slide is the saddest chart I've seen in my career. This is the yield uh, breakdown of the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index. Only 15, 16% of the Barclays Aggregate Investment Grade Bond Index yields more than 2%. 
and more than about 50% yields less than 1%, uh, and that's uh, pretty sad. The next slide shows the pressure that could be on treasury bonds. This shows that foreign buying that was very consistent from 2000 into 2013 and then got kind of shaky in 2015, it's now at the lowest level. The rolling 12 month is a liquidation by foreigners. So foreigners are not gonna be the buyers of US treasury bonds, particularly if the dollar uh, is on a long-term weakening trend, which I suspect. So the uh, supply of bonds is a problem and, and particularly at the long end, the Fed is committed of course to keeping rates at zero. They've said so in plain English for quite some time to come. So the long end is more uh, left to fend for itself. So we have seen the spread between two-year treasury yields go from a negative five basis points uh, in the middle of 2019 to one of the to the highest level of the past few years. We expect that will continue until the Fed decides that enough is enough and they want to come in and do more quantitative easing. You'll see the next slide how little the volatility has been in the 10-year Treasury yield. It almost looks like it's manipulated, right? I mean, the, the spread has been 20 basis points for over six months and the, the, the yield has been at about 70 to 80 basis points with remarkable um, consistency. Now, should it be there? If the market were not being manipulated, the answer is no by many indicators, which I'll go through quickly. The first is the copper gold ratio, the next slide, which tracks very closely the 10 year treasury yield for good economic reasons. The copper treasury, uh, the, gold, the copper gold ratio says the 10 year treasury should not be at 75 basis points, it should be more at 1.25. The next slide shows another indicator of where 10 year treasury yield should be. The red line is 10 year treasury yields, the blue line, is the relationship of cyclical versus defensive equity performance. That also suggests the 10-year treasury is too low. It suggests the blue line says the 10-year treasury should be at one and a half. The next slide is very long term. There's a very strong relationship between the 10-year treasury yield and nominal US GDP uh, year over year on a seven-year moving average basis, which is that red line is a seven-year moving average. You'll notice that it, they track broadly very closely, nominal GDP, seven-year moving average, and 10-year treasury yield. This suggests the 10-year treasury yield, God forbid, should be at 3.6%, so way too low. The next slide is shows that the 10-year treasury yield since 1967 was always higher than core personal consumption exp expenditure index of inflation year over year, seven-year moving average. That's not the case right now. The 10-year treasury yield is much lower than the seven-year moving average of the inflation rate. That suggests also 10-year treasury yields are fundamentally mispriced to the downside, probably due to manipulation. The next slide shows 10-year treasury yield versus average hourly earnings. And that for many years was way higher than average hourly earnings. When it's a green shaded area, it means the 10-year treasury yield is higher than the wage inflation. If it's red, it means it's lower and it's never been a gap this big, although with the stimulus, the average hourly earnings are probably distorted uh, to the upside, but still the red shade area has been in place for much of the last five years. Let me go quickly through uh, some aspects of the bond market. Here are corporate bond uh, yield spreads versus treasuries on an option adjusted spread basis. And they're all the way back to pre-COVID thanks to the Fed vi violating the Federal Reserve Charter that was put in place in 1913. Uh, and buying corporate bonds. They're actually not allowed to do that, but I guess desperate times, they decided called for desperate measures. Also, the next slide shows one of the reasons why corporate bonds have been so strong, uh, pretty substantial inflows into corporate bond ETFs subsequent to the March meltdown. The next slide shows the yield on uh, triple B, the lowest slice of corporate bonds and how pathetically low it is. It's virtually on the all time low at 2.3% which is kind of the same as the inflation rate. So at least our projection is the inflation rate will go up to the mid twos on the uh, headline CPI by the middle of 2021. And so you have no real yield at all on the lowest quality investment grade corporate bonds. The next slide shows that it's even worse than that because the yield is the all time low, yet the interest rate risk is the line on top, the red line is an all time high with the duration that's up there uh, this is this is not the corporate index, it's mislabeled. This is actually the aggregate index. I'll tell you, I have some super secret information. The duration, if this was charted correctly, of the corporate index is 8.7 year, year, years with a yield of 
In other words, if corporate bond yields rise 100 basis points over the next four years, the return on the investment grade corporate bond index for those full four years will be zero. Your price loss will take away your, your meager coupon. Also, the fundamentals are bad. Look at the next slide that shows the leverage ratios in the high yield market are up very significantly from the late 90s. And in the investment grade corporate bond market, they're up very significantly uh, in, uh, from uh, 2010. So much more leverage risk in the corporate bond market. The next slide shows the veil. Let's skip that slide. Let's go to the next one. Bankruptcies have also already started. Bankruptcies of companies with more than 1 billion in debt liabilities uh, have surpassed the trend of the last two significant recessions, the dot-com bust and the global financial crisis. And I would bet dollars to donuts that these bankruptcies are gonna increase. The next slide shows just how big the triple B bond market, uh, in that, uh, corporate bond market has become relative to the high yield market. Back in the 90s, there was kind of the same size. The triple B corporates were about the same size as the junk bond market. Now it's 250%. The reason I point this out is that downgrades could very significantly swamp the high yield bond market uh, because we could see the high yield bond market. If a third, say, of triple B corporates get downgraded, the high yield bond market will balloon in size, causing, I would suggest, significant indigestion. The next slide shows the OAS of high yield bonds, not all the way back to pre-COVID, but not very elevated anymore. The next slide shows something really remarkable. And this is the, the, the red shade, the red vertical areas are recessions. And you'll notice that during recessions, the red line, which is tightening standards for loans of co commercial and industrial loans, they explode, the, the, the credit standards get much tighter typically during recessions. And they have during this recession as well. The red line has exploded higher, typical of economic weakness. But look at the blue line, which is high yield spreads. Not surprisingly, when lending standards get tight, high yield bonds are under stress. This time, thanks to the Fed, they start, well, they start to get under stress, but thanks to the Fed, the stress has been removed. So the Fed has removed the liquidity problem in the high yield bond market, but they clearly have not removed the solvency problem. And let's go to the next, let's skip the next slide, go to the one after. We already see that defaults are rising. They've taken out the energy and commodity-based uh, default cycle of 2016. The black line is the entire uh, power-weighted default rate of high yield using Bank of America data. The gold line is if you exclude energy. So uh, we've taken out the uh, highs of the past 10 years. And again, dollars to donuts, I bet that this is gonna go higher. The next page shows that typically during a recession, you get uh, the default rate goes up to about 10 or 12%. Uh, that could happen this time because we are in a recession, but you'll notice that the spreads have not been able to, allowed to price at default uh, adjusted levels thanks to the Fed. So high yield bonds are extremely dangerous uh, over the next, say, few years as we go through a default situation. They've been held in check thanks to the Fed. The next page shows high yield defaults and the commercial and industrial loan standards, which we saw earlier. Not surprisingly, the tightening in standards, which is the bar chart, that leads by about four quarters the default rate. So one can expect, based upon experience, that the default rate in the high yield bond market should move towards a double digit number based upon the solvency problem that exists in the market, not a liquidity problem. Let's just look at how recoveries have gone in parts of the bond market, and then we can take a couple questions. You'll notice that bank loans have recovered pretty sharply. Their prices were by various uh, rating categories. They dropped all together in the COVID uh, March, April situation and now have largely recovered. The next page shows the repackaging of bank loans, which are CLOs, and it's a very different picture. The top uh, three categories, AAA down to single A, have all pretty much fully recovered. But then you get into the murky areas where there might be losses. And this is probably the area of maximum opportunity in the bond market. It's dangerous because there will be losses, but clearly the market is discounting in the lower credit rated tiers for the probability of losses. This is one part of the bond market which is allowed to find price discovery. It's difficult to deal in, but there's opportunity there. The next page shows 
something unusual has happened thanks to the Fed being particularly supportive of corporate bonds. We see that the yield on double A corporates is now the same as the yield on Ginnie Mae's, which is typically not the case. Typically, corporate yields are higher. So mortgages, agency mortgages are cheaper than corporates. The next page shows the option just in spread of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac residential mortgage securities, clearly way more elevated uh, versus uh, earlier this year than what we saw in the corporate bond market, so clearly cheaper. One thing that people talk about is Fannie and Freddie uh, uh, being privatized. It doesn't matter. Look at the next slide. The agency mortgage market uh, is not owned by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac at all anymore. The GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, own virtually nothing of the outstanding mortgage market. The percentage that's owned by the government has been relatively static for 20 years. It's changed hands. It's gone from Fannie and Freddie to the Fed, but the net effect is the same amount of ownership. The next page shows that with tightening lending standards, it has not had the typical effect on mortgage uh, uh, borrowing demand. Usually during a recession, the gold line, which is demand for mortgages, collapses and standards of lending go, uh, get tighter. This time, the standards are tighter, but the overwhelming demand, thanks to societal COVID shift, has overwhelmed that and the demand for mortgages is very high. Not the case in commercial mortgages at all. Next slide. This is a more typical pattern. In fact, it's exactly the same as the global financial crisis. The standards are tighter, the dark line, but the gold line, which is demand, has completely collapsed, which is one would expect. So the commercial mortgage market is an area that's dangerous as well, but also one of opportunity. The next slide is my last one. And this shows the prices um, of various sleeves of commercial mortgage-backed securities using Barclays data. And you'll notice that the blue line, which are triple A's, are at a new high, thanks to the Fed, they're actually supporting those. And the double A's, the red line, are basically uh, back to pre-COVID. And then you get down into the murky stuff, the single A's and the triple B's, where there are triple B's, we think there will be losses. So there should be a discount, but it's not uniform across the board. This is where active management is, uh, is a payoff presently in the bond market. And then you see the single A's, at 96, that's not much of a discount, but we think it's highly unlikely that you'll take losses in that category. Even if you have triple the defaults of the global financial crisis and worse recovery rates. So that's a very quick, broad overview of the world. And I'd like to uh, take questions if there are any at this time. Thanks. Yeah, Jeffrey, thank you very much. That was a terrific tour of, of the global economy and, and markets. And we do have uh, a number of questions. So we might, uh, we might run over just a few minutes because we do have a lot of uh, a lot of interest. Let me start first um, with the election. Maybe share your thoughts on the election and more importantly, what the ramifications may be for the markets. Uh, the, the market has held up pretty well, and there's you get different narratives about that depending upon people's political leanings. Some people say it's proof that there's going to be a blue sweep. I don't believe that's going to happen. Uh, other people say that it's proof that uh, Trump is going to pull the rabbit out of a hat because the market, if, broadly speaking, has liked Trump pretty well. I mean, the U.S. market has blown away the rest of the world, mar world stock market, as we've seen over the past uh, four years under Trump. I, I think that Trump is slightly, I would slightly favor Trump to win the election, but nothing like what I thought in 2016, where I was absolutely positive that Trump was going to win, even though the polls said he was going to lose. Now the polls say he's certainly going to lose, but I don't think the polls are accurate, just as they weren't in 2016. But I, I, I give Trump maybe a 50.01% chance of winning. It's not very high uh, because of just, just the, I'd say, uncertainties about the election outcome will be sadly much worse than 2016. What I do believe strongly is that the Senate will stay Republican. I think that if Trump loses, I actually think that people will want to uh, keep a split government. I think that people would be fearful. Those that just hate Trump, but don't really know what Biden's policies are because he doesn't want to tell you, or at least has made paid lip service to rather uh, significant socialist types of policies. I think people would want insurance policy against that and might even strengthen their vote uh, down ticket. So that's what I think is going to happen there. The market, in my mind, is suggesting that at a minimum, the Senate will stay Republican.
Great. Well, certainly worth noting because you were certainly correct in, in 2016. Um, a few uh, uh, questions direct from uh, the audience. Uh, one is, even if Treasury yields are fundamentally too low, the Fed is likely to continue to mani manipulate the Treasury market for at least another two or three years. Why should investors expect higher yields anytime soon? They shouldn't uh, at five years and in. However, the Fed has not protected the long end. We've seen the 30-year Treasury bond yield has gone from a low of 71 basis points intraday to the present level of 1.6. We're almost up 100 basis points already. So if the Fed uh, manipulating the market or willing to at times manipulate the market is supposed to prevent yields from ever rising, why have they risen? So the Fed seems to my observation to be willing to let yields rise up to a point. And I don't know where that point is. Fed, Jay Powell hasn't told us that, but I do believe they would be completely comfortable with the 30 year treasury bond going to two and a half percent. And that's the reason why I think the long end uh, has some upside. I also think the Fed would probably let the 10 year treasury go up to one and a quarter percent or so. And with uh, further stimulus and further deficits and no buyers uh, foreign and domestic buyers probably not very attracted. Are, are you attracted to an 80 basis point tenure with uh, the inflation rate headed to two and a half percent? I mean, I just don't see any fundamental reason. So all you've got to hang your hat on is the Fed. And since they've let rates rise to this point, I suspect they'll let them rise a little bit further. But when it comes to the two year treasury, no, the Fed is not gonna raise rates above zero in my view for at least five years. Great. And again, if you want to ask a live question, you can uh, raise your virtual hand and Gigi will patch you in. Uh, another one from the audience. Uh, could you expand on your forecast for the U.S. dollar? Do you see yes. it rising or falling and how would that impact the U.S. stock market? All right. I, I think that the U.S. dollar is going to be relatively strong in the very near term. So it bottomed out a few months ago, actually and has got, been gently rising since then. Uh, it's been uh, rising against emerging market currencies, uh, but it's, and it's also been rising uh, against, uh, it's also been rising against some of the developed currencies. But here's the big picture on the dollar. The dollar is extremely correlated historically to the long-term movement of the trade and budget deficits. So when the Twin deficits go up substantially, the dollar goes down substantially on a trend basis. That's been extremely consistent over history. These days, the uh, twin deficit is moving in opposite directions. The budget deficit is exploding and the trade deficit is actually shrinking a little bit. The trade deficit doesn't matter because it's so little compared to the budget deficit. So let's just focus on the budget deficit. It is at 15% of GDP. And Biden pledges to make it much higher. And Trump has, through his entire administration, made it very much higher, even during good economic times. So I think one thing we can take to the bank is the U.S. budget deficit is going to continue to be a huge expansion problem. That means that the dollar is going down on a trend basis. Not in the near term, I think, because I think it, it's, I think it's uh, become sort of a safe haven for the near term. But ultimately, the movement in the budget deficit is going to be fatal to the dollar. So I'm in the camp, like Ray Dalio, that the dollar is really living on borrowed time. When the dollar goes down, the U.S. stock market is going to massively underperform the rest of the world. It's been the strong dollar that supported the U.S. stock market. It's been the safe haven for all kinds of foreign investors. And if the dollar goes on a weakening trend, that's going to reverse. So I believe that it's, this is a time, gradualistically, you don't do it today, but one should be doing systematically increasing investments in stock markets away from the United States, as particularly as we could continue in the near term to potentially outperform due to a counter trend strength in the dollar. It's a golden opportunity to make that diversification step that will, I showed that chart about equity market peaks going back to the, to the 80s. That trend, I believe, will repeat itself, and the U.S. will be perhaps one of the weakest performing stock markets as we look forward 10 to 15 years. Great. I think you'll like this next one. It's from one of our, I think, one of our bond aficionados out there. Jeffrey, you focused on corporate IG and high yield through most of this, and the picture is bleak. Is structured credit with its collateral and cash flow a place to hide in 2021? 
And if so, which sectors of the ABS world? Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, you have to, the, the, the problem when you get into economic distress is the opportunities in the bond market are scary. And so that, that uh, precludes a lot of people from having the courage to take advantage of them. I showed in those charts that the areas that have not fully recovered are in the CMBS uh, middle tier credit sectors like double B and uh, triple B and single A and in the CLO market, which is repackaged bank loans, when you get down again to say maybe the triple B level, that's where the opportunities are. And in asset-backed securities, there isn't really much opportunity right now. Th that market has been remarkably strong, um, given the fact that consumer delinquencies have really gone down to many people's surprise. I showed that chart in the presentation. So the asset-backed securities market got really interesting. I'm talking about consumer receivables and stuff like that. It got interesting in the middle of this year, but I think it's more than fully recovered. So you have to go to the areas where you have economic exposure, and then you have to roll up your sleeves and have the resources and the people and the courage to go and do loss adjusted analysis in those lower tiers. And in those areas, you can probably be looking at returns that are in the high single digits. Great. So I know we're slightly over time. I'm gonna do one last question and then Gigi will reveal the uh non-investment effect for, for Jeffrey. Um, last question um, from our audience. A lot of questions have moved their headquarters uh, out of California over the last several years. Would you uh, or, and, and Double Line ever consider moving out of California? That's a really interesting question because you had asked me that three months ago, I would have definitively said there's no chance of me leaving California, but I can no longer say that. Uh, the um, deterioration in services, uh, the violence, the uh, threat of, of usurious tax regimes has led to the point where I'm presently, I would say, researching the idea of leaving California. I haven't made a decision I'm going to do it, but I'm researching it for the first time. I've been here 37 years and I've never even thought about thinking about leaving California. But it's not just the taxes, which we're talking 16.8 is being dangled in front of us, but also a wealth tax. And, but that's bad enough. But if you look at the services, I live in a very high end area, not surprisingly, of Los Angeles County. And in the last month, I have had power outages unannounced where the power went out for six and a half hours one day from three o'clock in the afternoon to 930 at night. I've had the sewer line fail for a day, right? And, I, and I've, so I've had all kinds of problems with basic services. The roads are a disaster. There's, I, I ventured out down through Santa Monica because I had an errand I had to run a couple of weeks ago and I hardly ever leave my property with this lockdown. And there are homeless shanty towns have sprung up in wealthy areas of Southern California. I'm talking about dozens and dozens of tents and cardboard box structures. And there is absolutely no uh, trend change in sight. And you drive down the 10 freeway, which is the artery, the main one from the west side of Los Angeles to downtown. And you'd swear you're in a third world country when you look at all the debris and broken glass and the condition of the roads, uh, you feel like you're living in Bangladesh. Uh, here in Southern California these days. And the exodus, I think, is going to be monumental, which of course is just a huge negative underwriting cycle for one of the primary catalysts of emigration, which is you always have to keep raising taxes. Just look at Connecticut, where they've had serial tax increases and never, they, never, uh, they never succeed because they, the politicians do simple math. They don't do uh, quality analysis. They take the amount of taxes they're getting today, and if they double the tax rate, well, they're gonna double the taxes, right? Wrong, because you affect human behavior. And that's, that's the part of the calculus that they, I think they're beyond the tipping point on that one, because if, they're, if they've got me researching it, I don't believe that I'm the only cockroach. Well, Jeffrey, we, we appreciate your, your openness and candor. Um, Gigi, would, would you share the, uh, the beginning uh, item? Uh, so I believe the correct answer is uh, write and plays his own songs. Is that right, Jeffrey? It's, it's absolutely correct. Yeah, I've, that, actually, I've actually, with lockdown, I've actually written a half a dozen 
Well, I say so myself, pretty good songs. I, I used to write songs when I was uh, in my early 20s. I was in a rock and roll band and I've kept all the instruments and stuff. And yeah, I do that. The idea that I would have won the chin up contest is laughable. It's laughable. Well, it looks I, like I, our, I was probably I was probably bottom quartile when it came it to looks chin-ups. Like our audience, the, 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 the uh, buy and flip homes with my brother is almost true. He, he, he is a remodeler and he does buy and flip homes. I'm just not involved with it. Well, it looks like our members were correct. They, they got that right. And I'm sure that's a good diversion from uh, investing. So when we're when we can have a SEBA meeting in person, we'll have to have you back and you can play us uh, one of your favorite songs. 